Amen. Okay, we're going to jump right into Romans chapter 10, verse 2. I've got to take you to a passage before we get to Acts because this is going to set the table on what the problem is that we're going to see in the text today. So Romans 10, verse 2 says this, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. Now what Paul is talking, that's the author here is, is saying today, is that the Israelite people, when Jesus the Messiah came on the scene, the Israelite people had passion, they had zeal, they had heart for God, but they did not have knowledge. And because they did not have knowledge, they missed the Messiah. We've done a lot of talking, if you've been following us in the book of Acts, there's been a lot of different moments where people, especially the Israelite people, have come against God's people, Jesus' people, persecuting them, throwing them in jail, even killing Christians because they thought they were doing God's work and they weren't. You can be very passionate about a lie. That's the big idea. And God calls us to a biblical faith that's not just heart, it's also brain. And the challenge that you're going to feel today, whether you're a seeker of Jesus or you're a longtime Christian, is we need a little bit more brain in our faith, brothers and sisters. That, that our faith in the past has been little and brittle because of it. Okay, so that's in the background. Now let's go into Acts chapter 14, and you're going to see this principle played out in this text. So Acts chapter 14, we're going to arrive in Lystra, and Lystra is a city, and this is Paul and Barnabas, and they are on their church planting missionary journey. We talked about it last week. It's about a year to two years. They're going throughout the ancient Roman world, the Mediterranean area, and they are preaching the gospel and planting churches. So they arrive at Lystra. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet, and he had been that way from birth. So he had never walked, and he was sitting and listening as Paul preached, looking straight at him. Paul realized that this man had the faith to be healed. How in the world did he discern that? There just must have been something in the guy's eyes. He knew he had the faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Can you imagine a man? who had never stood on his feet in his entire life. Wow. You know, well, what crippled him? What stopped him from being able to walk? And not just that, but if you've never walked in your entire life, what kind of muscle structure do you have in your legs at that point? Really? Yes. Like the, the miracle here is absolutely impossible because that's what miracles are. Impossible in our flesh, impossible in our own strength. They are supernatural. And so that's the power that flowed through Paul into this man. And all of a sudden, he doesn't just kind of stand up. He jumps up, it says. Love that picture. And it says that Paul looked at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. Now, why is that important? I just want to correct something just real quick before we move on. Faith, faith is not some kind of a thing that makes you worthy of healing. When you have faith, it's not something that opens some kind of a magical channel between you and God because of the power of your faith, because of you and your uh, stepping up uh, to the plate on this thing and, and kind of controlling your brain power and making faith happen that God is somehow obligated to give you a miracle. That's not what that's saying. What it's saying is that that, that God requires faith of us. And when God requires a thing of us, when we step up and we meet that requirement, God will respond. Amen. And it's not just that way with faith in the Christian life. It's that way with humility. It's that way with integrity. It's that way with prayer. The book of James says you have not because you ask not. Well, why do I have to pray for a thing in order for a blessing to flow? Because God said... Because God determined this was how it's going to work. And when you surrender to God's plan, things happen. 
Verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. This is one of these moments of humor in the scripture. I'll just give you a second. They're preaching about Jesus. Suddenly Paul does a miracle and they think Barnabas is Zeus. Why? Because they had grown up with the Olympian gods. That was their faith. They're in a different culture here. They're not speaking to Jewish people, Paul and Barnabas right now. They're speaking to Greeks. And because this was the faith that they were raised in, that's the lens that they're applying to the situation. So if he's using supernatural power, he must be one of the Olympian gods. And they jump to that conclusion, to Zeus and to Hermes, they see supernatural power, right? Like the gods in their, that particular faith, that particular mythology, they would sometimes come to earth. If you, if you grew up learning about this, they would sometimes come to earth and they would take human form. Zeus would especially, and he would give magical objects to people. Or sometimes he would take human form and he would sleep with women and create little demigods after him. Like that was part of it. And so that's, that's what they're calling Paul. Paul's not going to like this. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and they ran out among the people shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings, just like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God. Turn from what's fake to turn to what's real. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. The people of Lystra at this point were making sacrifices to them. That's how far they were going. Verse 16, in the past, he said, God permitted all the nations to go their own way. So there's, there's some mercy and grace from God there, but he never left them without evidence of himself. Say evidence. 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 He, God, God wants faith, but God's going to give evidence. And the evidence is important. Don't miss it. This is huge today. What evidence does he give of his goodness? He says, for instance, God sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. Well, what's that evidence of? What's he saying? He's saying, listen, when God sends rain on a regular basis to make sure that crops grow and the earth is green and you have food to eat, that's a good God. When the seasons happen and the crops grow in their season and you know every single year without fail when you should plant and when you should harvest and how it works because everything works on a consistent cycle, that's an intelligent God who loves his people. So God has built into creation signs and evidence that he exists. And what else has he given us? He's given us food and joyful hearts. Lunch today is evidence for God, amen? amen. My food will be, for sure. Hallelujah. Because God cares about not just sustenance, but pleasure. And God cares about Doritos, he does. <laughs> God cares about joy, and what, what's the joy there? Well, joy is, joy is love and family and all the things that God has given to us to not just make earth survivable, but to bring joy into our human lives. He's not just a good scientific designer. God is good and loving. Okay. Then go on to verse 19. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. So they just flipped the crowds. The crowd, crowd wasn't really believing in Jesus then they started to think that they were the Olympian gods. Now the Jews arrive who don't believe in Jesus and are like, Paul and Barnabas are bad guys and they actually win the day. And so they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around Paul, he got up and went back into the town. And the next day he left with Barnabas for D Derby. So that's kind of a miracle all, all on its own. He got stoned and then got back up alive again. So that's cool, but of all the possible miracles in scripture, this is the one I don't want because that sounds like a really painful miracle to be a part of, amen? amen. I would rather not be part of that one, uh, but he gets back up, thank God, and he goes on his missionary journey, but, but look at these people for just a second. What a crazy flip-flop. 
crowds, little and brittle. Let's look at that. First, they don't believe in Paul and Barnabas. Then number two, they believe that Paul and Barnabas are gods. Try to sacrifice to them. Then they don't believe Paul and Barnabas anymore. Instead, they believe the Jews. And then they try to stone Paul. That's a big day right there. That's a whole, a whole lot of flip flopping around. And, and, and what does it make you question? It makes you question the substance of their faith. How strong was your faith? Did you, did you actually understand at all what you were deciding about? Like when you got so excited that you were about to sacrifice to them and he had just, how, how do you go to sacrifice to somebody because he had done a supernatural miracle and then you're trying to stone him in the next heartbeat there? Like what it speaks to us is people that are not thinking through what they believe. They're not stopping and slowing down and asking questions, doing the research, read the books, take a, a, a breath for a second. They're just flip-flopping around. Um, I've said little and brittle for our faith. Little faith is the kind of faith, and it, it's the kind of faith that, that, that flies up too quickly and then it can be gone as soon as somebody asks a question. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Or a brittle faith where you had a faith, but it was super vulnerable and anything in your life that happened, all of a sudden your faith would fall apart. Jesus talked about this in uh, the parable of the seeds and the sower. He talked about some seeds would, would come up really fast and then get choked out or be scorched out by the sun. And sometimes our faith can be that way where, and, and maybe that's even in your history that I thought I found Jesus in this uh, part of my life. And then all of a sudden I lost my faith. And for some of us, we didn't really lose our faith. We just walked away from something that was little and brittle. It wasn't substantial in the first place. So how do we get a faith that is not little and brittle? Faith with a brain. How do we get that? Uh, I'm going to break faith down into three essential steps that I believe is biblical faith. I believe the Bible is very clear on what biblical faith is. So I'm going to give you the three parts. First off, you have to understand the evidence. You have to acquire knowledge. Um, and when you acquire knowledge and you ask the questions and you probe and you struggle and you take your time gathering the information, you start to understand. And once you start to understand what kind of evidence you have, then you can make a decision. And once you decide, then you can commit to your faith. But it all takes time, yes? So you've noticed that somebody put a stool behind me somewhere on stage. So I'm going to illustrate this. And I'm going to need your help. This is a little bit Marco Polo. I'm going to sit on this stool without looking at said stool at all. But I need you. So here we go. Are you awake? Okay. So am I, cl am I close? No? To the left? Should I just sit right here? No? Okay. Okay. Left? Huh? Excellent. Excellent. Look at you. Okay. So let's break this down. I know it seems silly, but I had to acquire evidence. What was my evidence? Evidence number one is I saw a stool existed before service. Evidence number two, I asked one of our head ushers, a highly trusting guy named Nick, to bring this up here. Um, you guys all were pointing me in a direction, um, helping me find where to go, but stop for a second and realize I wasn't looking at the stool. When I went to sit down, how did I know? I trusted and some of you were not trustworthy people who were telling me where to sit. <laughs> some of you were yelling out the wrong thing. Luckily, I have discernment and I know you. Um, Amen. The way it works with God, we always have to acquire evidence so that we can understand. And once we've acquired evidence so that we can understand, a decision point comes. Don't miss this part. When we acquire evidence, we don't have all the evidence. We don't have airtight arguments for every single one of our questions before we finally decide and commit. 
There's always some kind of a gap there. And that's where we have to trust. That's what biblical faith is, is, is you've got to walk in that trust. But it's not just with biblical faith. It's with faith with any area of your life, yes? Even in your, like, think about your marriage relationship for a second. You build trust with another person, and then you have to act on trust the rest of your life. Some of you have struggled with that, where it's like, we built some trust, and they proved to me that they were trustworthy, and then I found that I had such kind of a thing in my past that I couldn't trust them going forward, and that's a broken relationship. We're supposed to be able to extend trust when it's appropriate, when we have evidence and reason to do so. So let's see the scripture talk about this same idea. Three parts of faith. First off, understand, look at this, Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So God comes and says, I want to teach you something and I need your brain. We're going to have a conversation and we're going to reason together. That's okay when it comes to faith. Next verse, 1 Peter 3, 15 says it even better. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Massive verse right there. What Peter is saying is that any of you today who have surrendered your life and heart to Jesus Christ, before you made that decision, you had a reason. Before you made that decision, you had acquired all your evidence. You had asked all of your questions and you had gotten to this point where this was the move to make. And somebody else is going to come along at some point. They're going to ask you, what was your reason? And you need to be able to give it. But that's brainy stuff, yes? Next, R.C. Sproul says, it's not virtuous to take a leap of faith. If that means we plunge into a rationality. The Bible never calls us to leap into the darkness, but to leap out of the darkness into the light. I love the way he says that right there. Some of us have been told growing up, um, faith is just a leap. It's blind. It's just a blind leap of faith, right? It's Indiana Jones and and, um, uh, the search for the Holy Grail, if you remember that movie. And one of his tests is he comes up to this edge of this cliff and it looks like he's about to plunge to his death. And he has to take the leap, right? And and we all see that. And some of us are like, yeah, that's just what they told me. That's the way Christianity works. What I'm telling you today is that's not how Christianity works. God gives you evidence, but he does leave a gap for you to trust. It will not be airtight, but it will also not be blind. We're going to get into why sometimes people have told you that it's blind, but it's not true. Number two, decide. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and is the conviction of things not seen. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. This is a spot, it's a kind of a classic spot in the New Testament where the Bible tries to define what faith is or at least part of what faith is. And, and faith uh, is the assurance of things that you hope for, the conviction of things not seen. Um, in the NIV, it says faith is the substance of things that you have hoped for or the things that are unseen. It's what comes in place of that. So, so the Bible's acknowledging that you may be acquiring all of your evidence and then there's this gap. And what do you do with the gap? With the gap, you trust You've got all this substance, and then this part lacks substance. What goes in there is your trust. Because you're not going to see everything. Um, there was a guy that I worked with um, or, or became friends with um, in college. His name was Dan. Dan was an atheist, and I've told this story before. But Dan and I used to meet up at coffee shops and talk about Jesus and talk about God. And, and, and he was this atheist who had tons of questions, and it was all really heady stuff. And I hadn't read all the philosophy books, okay? I didn't start that way. I didn't read my first book, I think, until I got to college. You're like, what about all the book reports? I lied on all of them. <laughs> For real. I just didn't like reading. I just didn't like, I, I, I came to like it. But I didn't like it at first. And all of a sudden, I've got this guy who's asking me all these passionate questions. And and guess what? I didn't have the answers. And I needed to tell him, honestly, I don't have the answers to all these things. But I'll find them. 
I'll go and read. I'll go ask pastors. I'll go find out for you what the answers to these questions are. And he and I just struck up a friendship that way. We'd be in coffee shops till two, three in the morning talking about everything that he wanted to know. And he was patient with me and it was a wrestle. It went on for like a year. But I remember Dan coming to me at one point and he's like, you know what? If my atheism is right here and God's over here and there's like a bridge in between, I've walked so far on this bridge, it's now harder for me to go back than to go forward. And what's he acknowledging there? He's acknowledging that that's the journey of Christ. That's the journey of faith is that you start pursuing that evidence and that's a good journey. Faith is not anti-questions. Faith is anti-laziness, actually. So there will be gaps. Next, commit. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is Jesus acknowledging the gap. Jesus is like literally looking around in the gospels. He's seen all these people that have heard all his teachings, met him face to face, and seen his miracles in person. And he's like, this is all great. You guys have got some faith. But the real blessing are for the people that are going to come later. And they didn't get to see all this. Why? Because they will have a greater gap in which to trust God. That gap leads to trust. And sitting on the stool requires your faith to grow. Amen. Okay, so in those three steps there's some missteps that we sometimes take in the church. And this is where I'm going to be a little bit more confrontational with you. If you're a seeker today of Jesus, you've got questions. You see yourself as somebody that is maybe asking questions about God, but you've not taken the leap yet. The challenge I would say is don't get paralyzed waiting around for an airtight everything before you finally make a decision. Sometimes our culture in modern times we try to defend that airtight demand and it won't work. Again, it doesn't work in your relationships. It doesn't work in anything. The other thing I would say is to the Christians, people have sometimes told you that everything is blind and you can skip the understanding part. And when you've believed that, your faith has been little and brittle. And God wants it to be stronger. I was reading recently about uh, the army and a friend of mine, Jeremy Trenum, one of the pastors here was telling me about this particular situation. Um, but I'll read you this quote. It says, today's recruits are coming from a far more sedentary lifestyle compared to previous generations, making their skeletons more prone to injuries because they're not used to the kind of intense activity they will face at basic training. Amen. <laughs> okay, here's what's happening. The army knows what it is to bring brand new recruits into basic training and then be fine. Recently, in recent years, they have noticed a lot more broken bones and stress fractures in new recruits as they've gone through basic. And as they've tried to study that and say, what in the world is going wrong with humanity right now? Is it came back to a sedentary lifestyle, too much time on the couch. <laughs> Some of you are really enjoying this maybe too much. <laughs> Just look at, the, look at the logic here for a second. If you live a life where you're not enduring a lot of small to medium impacts against your bones, your bones will not build density and the kind of mineral structure that they need in order for you to be able to handle larger impacts later on. That's all the science is saying. And so if you subject yourself, like some of us grew up subjecting ourselves, being on BMX bikes and like crashing into curbs and jumping things and like, you know, out hiking and wrestling with your friends and you do all the things growing up across years, small to medium impacts, sometimes larger impacts, depending on who you are. You build strength in your bones, and you can handle greater stress. That's all it's saying. Is it possible 
that our faith is little and brittle because we have not exercised it? Is it possible that our faith is little and brittle because we've not handled the challenges that God has put in front of us to walk through? How do you strengthen your faith? Proverbs 18, 17. Look at this one. It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other one comes and examines him. That verse says, don't be gullible. That verse says, slow it down. Just because this person seemed right doesn't mean that they are. So slow down, think it through, do your research. That particular article was clickbait. It wasn't actually real. Ever do that? You know what I'm talking about. This is something that's a daily part of our lives. Do the research, check the footnotes, be sure. Well, what does that mean? We need to do that in Christianity as well as in every other area of our life. Slow it down, deepen what you believe in. That's what that's calling us to. I had this brilliant history teacher in high school. And um, do you know Charles Lindbergh? I'm going way back. Charles Lindbergh, famous aviator, back in like 1940s, 1950s. Super popular guy, um, massive for America. Anyway, he and his wife have a little baby. The baby gets stolen. The baby is killed. Super sad story. But they find the killers who killed the baby. Trial of the century. Everybody's following it in the newspapers. Who did this? How this whole thing's going to unfold? So my wonderful history teacher, when I'm in high school, she, um, she comes to class, gives us the background, makes us watch a documentary. And the documentary basically showed you all the evidence for the, why this one couple who was tried and convicted for this crime, why they had done it. And then she uh, surveyed us all at the end and said, how many of you believe that they did it? All our hands went up. And then we came back to the next class the next week. She played us a second documentary. And according to this documentary, it was all a plot. It wasn't these two people that had done it. America just needed somebody to blame. And so they set these two up, made up evidence. And this is the way that it unfolded. They, they didn't do it according to the second documentary. And then, of course, she asked us and we're like, no, they didn't do it. We completely flip-flopped. We sometimes are easy to convince. Amen. Slow it down. Ask the questions. Do the research. This is in Christianity. This is in politics. Let me just take a breath on that for a second. Amen. This is in science. This is in medicine. Slow it down. Do the reading. Take your time. Don't be lazy about it. If you're a seeker of God today and you've not given your heart to Christ yet, let me just say this to you. Um, ask the questions and read. And I'm gonna say it again, read. Reading is hard, yes? But read, you have to. YouTube videos won't get it done. They just don't go deep enough. The kind of questions that you have if you're, again, if you're in a place of seeking, the kind of questions you have are not settled in a YouTube video. They're not settled in this sermon today. If you've got questions about the existence of God, if you've got questions about the authenticity of the scripture, there are places that you can go and you can find answers to that. Um, there's, a, there's an argument called the fine-tuning of the universe that you can read about that is, is scientifically backed. And it's the idea that why is the earth the exact distance from the sun so that we don't burn up and we also don't freeze up, but actually life can survive and life can thrive because of the exact distance from the sun that we are. That the way that the, the seasons work and, and, and the, 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 the tides and, and gravity and everything is so perfectly fine-tuned. You, you can line up all these different qualities of our universe. And you can say it was exactly set by somebody so that we could survive and thrive. Look at it. There's something called the Kalam argument that looks at the age of the universe as proof for God because the universe is expanding, had a finite beginning, and will have a finite end. Look into all of that kind of stuff. Look at the moral argument for God. C.S. Lewis talks about that in Mere Christianity is his book where he lays out the fact that there is a moral code built into every single human being, regardless of culture, regardless of time throughout history, that we all know that lies are better than truth. 
We all know that loyalty is better than disloyalty. We all know that courage is better than fear and cowardice. There's things, it's, it, it's an amazing list of things that we just all know, regardless of how you grew up. And not only do we know all of this is right, but we know we're not doing it. We know we stand judged by that list of morality that we are not doing and that we need a savior. The moral argument shows us that it is far beyond instinct. It's not your instinct. It's what you know you should do and you're not doing and only Jesus did. It's built in us. What is that? That's God calling to us, showing us that he is there. You got questions maybe about the New Testament and whether or not you can trust it. Look at the manuscript evidence. There's resources I could get to you where you could look at the manuscript evidence and, 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 and what we have in museums today and how those things allow us to trust that what we have here is what they actually wrote. You could look at the evidence of the resurrection. Say that there's, there's no other way for you to put the whole thing together except to realize that someone named Jesus Christ had actually died and came walking out of a tomb three days later. And if somebody did that, we need to listen seriously to what he had to say. Amen. But I'm not just going to say those things to you. What I'm saying is there's resources where you can delve deeply into any of those areas where you've got questions. By the time you're done, it won't be airtight and there will be a gap. But don't skip the evidence gathering and the questioning part first. If you want books and resources, see me after class and I will get them to you easily. That'd be wonderful. Um, then to the Christians. I know everybody in this room does not enjoy reading philosophy books. Amen? That's scary. Today's message is not a call to greater academic performance on your part. You can relax. I'm not saying you got to enjoy it. But when God brings somebody into your life that has questions, love demands that you help. Amen. Love demands that you do what's uncomfortable to you. Love demands that you sacrifice time out of your schedule and that you're willing to read along with somebody else so that they can get their questions answered. If nothing else, you'll have a Dan in your life that at least knows he's loved by you. And that is especially, that is so true of the parents in the room and the grandparents in the room. This is massive. Some of you, let me just call this out. Some of you grew up in a generation where everybody believed that the Bible was true. This generation growing up in your home right now does not believe that the Bible is true. They need to ask questions. And you need to not say to them, it's a blind leap of faith, leave me alone. Because sometimes that's what we're doing. Sometimes we're deflecting and we're not loving. It takes time to love people well. And those kids and grandkids that are, that are coming up in your home that have these questions, man, let it take you deeper, Christian, than you've ever gone before. I just raised three teenagers into adulthood, and the conversations in our kitchens at night, my goodness, they were not easy on me. But it made me a better man myself to go through that with them. Yes. Okay, next, test what you're taught. Acts 17, 11, this is so massive. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. What does that say? It says, one of these places that Paul and Silas, it's not Barnabas, we'll talk about that later, actually stopped was a place called Berea. And they had a certain nobility to them, some of your translations say, that they didn't just trust what pastors told them just because a pastor said it. They took things that the pastor said, and then they opened up their own Bible and double-checked. That takes time. That takes reading. That takes effort. But I think for some of us in the room, that's the way God is going to take you from a little and brittle faith to a deeper, stronger faith. Remember the bones? Maybe God will increase the strength of your spiritual skeleton, so to speak, if you keep going back to the scripture on the things that I teach. Do not trust me too much, please. I don't want to be responsible for that. I want to preach to people who are going to double check me 
And when I'm wrong on something, you're going to let me know I was wrong on something. Or if you're not convinced, then stay unconvinced until God convinces you. But open up your Bible. Um, Next, be expert on Jesus. When God decided to send salvation, he didn't send an airtight argument. He sent an airtight person. He didn't send an abstract principle. He sent a human being. Such a helpful quote from Tim Keller. Uh, this is a man who, who launched a church in New York City and, and dealt with a whole lot of highly educated intellectual types that were looking for, I want an airtight argument for the existence of God, for the person of Jesus, that he was who he claimed he was. I want every single one of my questions with an airtight argument, please. Please. And he came to this place where he's like, it's not an airtight logical argument that can be mapped out. It's an airtight person who you have to face. And that's a real change. I I would also argue it's the only way history could have consistently held up God's argument down through the ages. It's because it was a person. It was holistically a person. It was a person who didn't just teach the best truth ever taught. He loved people better than anyone's ever been loved. He used his power in all the right ways, and he eventually sacrificed himself for us. Jesus is a holy other thing, and and looking at Jesus is like gazing into the diamond of the Christian faith. He just is, and you can't ever be done. So if you're a seeker today, I would say read the gospel start to finish all four books. And when you get to the end, read them again and get to know who Jesus is and what he was about and let that challenge you. If you're a Christian here today and you're not sure where you should be reading in the scripture, start with Matthew and keep going. Read the gospels over and over and over again. Why? Because you don't know Jesus well enough yet. And the more you know Jesus, more, the, the deeper you are with Jesus himself, the better you'll be. got this quote for you. Philip Schaff said this. He's a historian. He says, this Jesus of Nazareth without money or arms conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Jesus, without eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet without writing a single line. Do you know Jesus never wrote a single line? He set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. He blew everybody away 2,000 years ago. And we're still talking about He's He's the only thing we're still talking about. He's it. He's everything. Amen. Not just in the church, even outside the church. Amen. Even if they don't love him, they still don't know what to do with him. He's such a wrestle. Next, step boldly when God calls you forward. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you read that right, Jesus basically said, there's this instrument of execution, like an electric chair called a cross. Not only am I going to the cross, but I'm calling you to pick up your own cross. When God calls you, Don't just understand and decide. Commit. Commit. And it's in the committing. It's in taking bold steps of obedience and sacrifice with God that he will grow and deepen your faith. Bone density. God will do that with you. But you're going to have to do what he tells you to do. Christianity can't be a religion or a faith or a philosophy or a theory for you. It's got to be what you actually start to walk out by faith. Remember Hebrews 11, by faith. Noah built an ark by faith. Moses confronted Pharaoh by faith. David confronted Goliath and risked his own life by faith. We all love the outcomes of those stories, but put yourself right there at the decision point when someone actually committed and risked their own life. It was by faith. There was a gap. They had to trust and they went forward. And as they went forward, God built their faith up. They didn't just succeed. They got stronger as people. This is what God has called us to. By faith, 
you will have to at some point follow God's wisdom on sexuality. If I can put it like that. This culture has an ethic of sexuality. Jesus' ethic is different. It will require faith and commitment for you to follow Jesus' way instead of culture's way. Jesus has an ethic that has to do with giving away your money to those in need and to the poor and being generous to the kingdom of God. You're not going to give money to anybody because your culture doesn't want you to. Your, your culture wants you to amass more and more and more and more than the next person. To give away your faith is an act of, or give away your money is an act of faith. It's a great act of faith. Let's talk about forgiveness. Has anyone betrayed you yet? Has anyone abused you yet? If not, it's coming. There's no joy in that statement to me. But when it comes, Jesus Christ calls you to forgive. And that makes no logical sense. There's a gap there. You will have to trust your Savior in order to forgive anybody. By faith, you'll have to walk. If you're a seeker today, keep seeking. The claims of Jesus are massive for your soul, for all eternity. He lays claim to you. Ask your questions, probe, research, read, have conversations with those that will have patience with your questions, love you enough to walk with you through that journey. Find the bottom of your questions because questions are not the enemy of Christianity. Laziness is. This last Wednesday night, we had a worship night and our students had just gotten back from camp and I just, I have to celebrate them for a second. Our students are walking out in a real faith. They're asking real questions and they're demanding people ask, answer those questions. And they're flipping the narrative. That's all I saw on Wednesday night. They're just flipping the narrative. You know what the narrative is? Sadly, the, narr the narrative tends to be what I observe as a pastor is a lot of people get raised in the church as kids. They get to around high school and they throw the faith out because it was mom and dad's faith. It wasn't theirs. It didn't pass the test for them. And because of that, they go off into college and early adulthood and they don't follow God at all. And they kind of do it their own way. And then they get married and they have some of their verse first kids. And they see that little kid. Tell me if I'm wrong. They see that little kid and they're like, well, I was raised in the church. That was kind of a good experience. I think I'll raise this baby in the church. And people come walking through their, th those doors with their brand new babies all the time saying, I just want to raise them in the faith. What they don't realize is God has a plan for them Amen. as mom and dad. And they're going to learn about the faith again. And they're going to realize the decisions they haven't made yet. And they're going to reacquire a faith in Jesus that's not their parents, it's theirs. Some of you have come to this church and you've gotten saved here and you thought you already were saved. That's the story a lot of us have. But these students went off to camp with great leaders who loved them. And many of them came back saved and recommitted. And they're not waiting. Why? Because they're in an environment right now where people love them enough to let them ask their questions. And people are walking them through the struggle of those teenage years. And we saw 15 of them get baptized this last Wednesday night. 15. They're flipping the script. But you know what was really shocking about the baptism service when you watched it? Was they didn't all get baptized by staff pastors. Ed Muniz baptized. Harper Mason baptized. Molly Alonzo, baptized. Carrie Meyer, baptized. Rachel Bustos, baptized. And Lily Schreffler, baptized. Six of our non-staff, non-pastoral leaders who've just been loving these teens and went to camp with them, available for questions. And of course, when those, those students go to get baptized, you're gonna baptize me, not a pastor. Guys, that's a win. That's a win. Praise God for that. 
Moms and dads, we need to be challenged. We need to feel this. Don't deflect questions or avoid. Don't tell them it's just a leap of faith. That has been a crutch for you. Don't make it a crutch for them. Face it. All right, let's pray. Would you guys stand? We'll stand and then we'll pray. Jesus Christ, we ask this authentically, honestly. Give us a faith with a brain. We don't want little and brittle anymore. We want the real thing, and we want to give the real thing to our kids and our grandkids. Lord, help us. Jesus, only you can supernaturally give this kind of faith. And so we do depend on you for a miracle right now. Help us to walk away from laziness. Help us to be faithful with our questions. In Christ's name, amen.